ship would rise out of the wave and slam down into it with such an impact that it made you think that it was possible that it would break it in half. As the storm tore through the region, the sailors got a crash course in battling an enemy more treacherous than the Japanese. The third fleet was being ambushed by a killer typhoon. A typhoon is the Pacific's version of a hurricane, a spiraling mass of wet, gusting air that gathers speeds up to 150 miles an hour, bringing with it blinding rains and punishing winds. The eye is the most intense part of a tropical cyclone, and so that's where the most intense winds and the most intense seas are created. It's like a big vacuum cleaner, and in that eye, there's a big, giant sucking sound. And that low pressure is what causes the intensity of the storm, the intensity of the winds, and the concomitant intensity and height of the seas. Typhoons are one of the strongest forces in nature on the planet. A typhoon has a huge extent. The effects can be felt over 800 miles away, and it can be over many, many days. Most typhoons sputter and die out before reaching killer status. But if conditions are right, a typhoon will slowly pick up power and momentum until it explodes upon the ocean. Ninety fighting ships of the Third Fleet were on a collision course with just this kind of typhoon. And Admiral William Bull Halsey didn't see it coming. Born on October 30th, 1882, William Halsey seemed destined for glory. He entered the U.S. Naval Academy in 1900 and a brilliant military career was launched. Halsey was revered for his victories at Guadalcanal and Leyte Gulf. General Douglas MacArthur considered him to be the greatest fighting admiral of the war. Bull Halsey really was an icon to us. We were really enthralled with the guy. He had a heart for his sailors, and we knew that. The word was out that Halsey was a sailor's sailor. He was the kind of a guy that uh, always wanted to get out there and get him. His first message to the fleet was one word, attack. By the fall of 1944, U.S. forces were waging a ferocious battle against the Japanese in the Philippines. Halsey and his men were taking a beating from kamikaze bombers. The kamikaze was, in effect, the first guided missile, only using a human pilot as the guidance system. The bomb hit you, along with the plane itself. It was pure hell. By December, Halsey was determined to rebound. General MacArthur ordered Admiral Halsey to provide the air support vital to regaining control of the Philippine Islands. He desperately needed this air support. And Halsey, above everything else, felt that that was his main mission, to provide that air support. Halsey accepted this job with characteristic gusto. He helped devise a plan nicknamed the Big Blue Blanket after the Navy football team. The strategy was for the Third Fleet to support MacArthur's ground troops by covering or blanketing all enemy air installations on the Philippine island of Luzon with round-the-clock air raids. On December 9, 1944, the Third Fleet anchored at an island about 1,200 miles from Luzon prepared for battle. The Third Fleet was an imposing force as it cruised into the Philippine Sea. Much of the fleet was made up of inexperienced but fiercely patriotic young sailors. These were young men, many of whom were absolutely incensed over the attack on Pearl Harbor. They wanted to support their country. These kids who came from all walks of life and all strata of society. No matter whether rich or poor, they all went in there and they did a great job. 22-year-old Patrick Duhan was one of 263 men who made his home aboard the destroyer, the USS Hull. 
after Pearl Harbor, I felt it was my duty to uh, go to join the Navy and go to war for my country. As chief quartermaster on the hull, Archie de Riker's duties included setting all clocks on board, bringing him in contact with everyone from the officers on the bridge to the enlisted men down below. They used me as their walking newspaper. They liked to know what was going on up in the bridge. What's the latest scoop? Hey, Archie, what's going on? <laughs> Ray Schultz, chief boatswain mate who had survived Pearl Harbor, was in charge of ordering supplies for the ship. I issued everybody a new life jacket, and we ordered whistles and lights, one cell flashlights, to go with the jackets. To help diffuse the tension about the dangerous mission that lay ahead, sailors in the Third Fleet were also given a chance for a little rest and relaxation at their home base, Ulithi Atoll. Sunshine, blue sky, smooth water. Ulithi was the place where we relaxed for what little relaxation there was. What recreation we could get out of what we did, they had what we called Iron City beer. We understood it had a little formaldehyde in it to make sure that it didn't spoil. And after we'd have a beer party, all of us had a little formaldehyde in us too. But as the men of the Third Fleet prepared to sail, forces of nature were conspiring to cause a catastrophe unlike any mortal enemy could inflict. And Admiral Halsey's winning combat record would do little to prepare him for the terrifying battle that lay ahead. On December 10th, 1944, Bull Halsey's third fleet sailed into the Philippine Sea. Its mission, to help General Douglas MacArthur reclaim the Philippines. For the next few days, they cruised into formation and prepared for battle. The weather was overcast, but the seas were fairly calm. When dawn broke on December 14th, the fleet had sailed into their ocean position 200 miles northeast of Manila. They were ready to provide air cover for the tiny island of Mindoro. Admiral Halsey's command echoed through the loudspeakers. Pilots, man your planes. He was possessed with the overriding necessity of getting the aircraft in the air to deliver their weapons against targets selected by MacArthur. For the next three days and nights, the men of the Third Fleet suppressed the deadly kamikazes and dropped bombs on enemy hangars. The air support had proved to be very effective, and MacArthur had been able to make the landings he planned on Mindora and establish the fields that he wanted to establish for ground support. Bull Halsey was ready to prepare for the next attack on Luzon. On December 16th, as the victorious ship sailed east to their rendezvous point for refueling, a tropical disturbance was gaining speed, power, and moisture over the open seas. Halsey was unaware of this approaching danger. By modern standards, they were really operating in the dark. The weather satellites didn't exist. They had not established a, the technique of weather aircraft and weather surveillance by aircraft. And so they had to make judgment calls. As a matter of fact, it was sometimes luck of the draw that a, that a plane returning from mission would see weather. That's exactly what happened on December 17th. As the storm moved closer and the weather began to deteriorate, one of the fleet's search pilots spotted the storm from his plane and sent a report to Halsey's flagship, the USS New Jersey. Since weather data was considered tactical information, the message had to go through a lengthy decoding process. The report didn't reach Admiral Halsey in time. He was leading his fleet straight into the storm. The smaller vessels, such as destroyers, were at greatest risk. Destroyers are called tin can because uh, they have a lot of armor, but not much armament. They're very light. They're made for speed. They're 300 feet long. That sounds like a pretty big ship, but compared to some of the other ships, the other ships we were operating with were pretty small. By early morning on December 17th, the so-called tin cans were being bounced around at the mercy of the heavy winds and waves. 
as they tried and failed to refuel. Refueling is vital in bad weather because the weight of the fuel helps keep the ship stable. By 11 a.m., the seas were getting rougher and the barometric pressure was falling rapidly. And when it starts dropping, you've got a problem. The storm is near. That's, that's the warning. And when the bottom started dropping out of it, we all said, uh oh, there she goes. Bull Halsey was perched on his post aboard the New Jersey, trying to balance the considerations of weather and military maneuvers. Archie de Riker and his shipmates on the hull waited for official word to take precautions. They were surprised when it didn't come. Other ships had determined that we were in the path of a typhoon, and they couldn't understand why Com Third Fleet did not take action to avoid it. That struck us as something that was peculiar and almost unbelievable. When we could see, as plain as day, that the weather was not going to improve, it was going to get far worse. Halsey had to weigh the options. A challenge, I think, for he and the battle staff was to make decisions that not only kept the safety of the fleet in mind, but also the fact that they were supposed to be dropping bombs on target. Halsey persisted with the command to refuel and stay in formation. Individual ship captains started to prepare for the worst. Charles Calhoun was a 31-year-old graduate of the Naval Academy from Philadelphia and captain of the USS Dewey. I had been told by my favorite executive officer, if you're encountering uh, weather where the barometer falls at a rate of 0.03 inch per hour or greater, you're encountering a typhoon and you had better, in his quaint phrase, all ass, unquote. <laughs> Captain Calhoun knew it was time to take care of his ship before all else. We moved everything that could be moved from stations high on the ship to stations low on the ship with the idea that everything we could reduce or lower into the bottom of the ship would improve our stability. Just a mile away from the Dewey, Henry Plage, the 29-year-old captain of the USS Taberer, gave his sailors the order to prepare their ship for severe conditions. We told them to batten down all hatches as a general term with stormers approaching. Uh, take all precautions uh, and they had been trained in what to do in those situations and so they did it by the time the sailors of the hull tried to take action it was too late the storm was hitting them at full force that night it was pure havoc on the bridge the waves were so great and the wind was at such a high velocity that the uh, rain it would just about cut your skin it would coming down at such a force the ship was plunging pretty badly and uh, up and down in motion and starting to roll pretty badly. When I arrived up on the second deck and stepped out behind the chart house, I realized that the starboard side of the ship was submerged. It was actually a wash. And the ladder, the starboard ladder to go to the bridge was a wash. I thought, good Lord, we're really laying over. By midnight, the third fleet was cruising into the eye of one of the most destructive storms to ever hit the U.S. Navy. Finally, at 8 o'clock the next morning, Halsey informed General MacArthur that refueling was impossible. Halsey's fleet would not be able to provide cover for MacArthur on December 19th. The first priority was to avoid what was now clearly a deadly typhoon. By the morning of December 18, 1944, a typhoon was ripping through the U.S. Navy's third fleet in the Philippine Sea. Planes on aircraft carriers were torn from their steel davits, crashing into each other and catching fire. Ships rolled and pitched as mountains of water enveloped their decks. Charles Calhoun remembers hearing the worried crew members of the Dewey out on the open bridge reciting the words of the Navy hymn. 
eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm doth bound the restless wave. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. Then Captain Calhoun made a critical decision. He abandoned attempts at getting back into fleet formation. I had a squadron commander aboard who also happened to be the screen commander in command of all the destroyers in that u unit. So I was able to simply turn to him and say, Commodore, I'm concerned about my ship and I'm just going to save the ship. And he said, I agree with you. The skippers of some of the other destroyers didn't have that privilege. The USS Ho was one of those unlucky ships. The morning of the 18th, conditions aboard the hull were unmerciful. Second-class Petty Officer Pat Duhan was up on the bridge in the afterdeck house trying to hold on. Just hanging on for dear life because the ship was rolling at such a rate and the waves, when they'd break over the bow, they'd come clear up practically over the bridge. And a destroyer being a small craft like that, why, you're at the mercy of the elements. Waves were pouring onto her decks while the rolls submerged entire sides of the ship. Supply officer Ray Schultz was up on deck as the wind velocity approached 100 knots. The ship pitched and rolled wildly. All you can do is hang on to anything close by. You just grab and hang on to it until the ship come back up. With zero visibility and unrelenting rain, the hull suffered electrical failures. As the destroyer withstood her body blows, she lost radar, radio, and shortly before noon, steering capabilities. The hull was now rolling at 70 degree angles. Each time you think, well, this is the last time it's going over, and then something would happen and a wave would push it back up. Pat Duhan struggled to get on deck and grab a life jacket. When I came out of the apartment where there was a life jacket hanging out of a gun. A spare life jacket hung on a gun, and I put it on. The ship steadied momentarily. Then came a huge gust of wind that forced her to her starboard side at a nearly 90 degree angle. Water poured into her hull and superstructure. Just after 12 noon, the 1,400-ton destroyer surrendered to the sea and capsized. The wave swept me up there just after I slipped that life jacket on, and the ship was on its side then. And uh, then a few minutes later, while I was swept clear of the ship. Of the 263 sailors aboard the hull, as many as 100 were trapped below decks. They went down with the ship. I remember <sighs> Bruno, Joe, John Tom, Dickie. The good friends that I do. Men in the water felt the shudder of the USS Hull as she sank. I felt the ship explode on me. I mean, you could feel the pressure. And uh, then I was by myself. The ship sunk right under us, just dropped down below us. And uh, as it sunk, it, the suction took us to down pretty deep. I recall my ears hurt pretty bad. With their ship gone, the men were left alone to battle the elements. Some had made it into lifeboats. Others, including Ray Schultz, were washed into the sea with only life vests to help keep them afloat. Big wave just beats the tar out of you. It just threw you around like a, a just, just like a ball or a cork. Threw you, then just beat you up and down. The wind during the typhoon was so extremely strong that you could not face it. It was just pelting in force. I mean, it, just like somebody throwing sand in your face. Terrific sandblaster. 
Between the heavy rain and the tumultuous sea, the sailors were completely disoriented. When you go down deep, you don't know which way's up. You start swimming as half as you can to get to the surface. And if you come up in a trough, well, you get another one. But if you come up on the peak of a wave, then uh, you shoot up out of the water, the wind will pick you up and blow you up against the next wave. One of the best indications you had that you were back on the surface was that you would hear the wind screaming and uh, feel it, the spray blowing against you. The spray was so heavy, put your hands over your face like this to breathe. As the hours passed on December 18th, the men tried to figure out ways to conserve their energy. Pretty soon learned to roll up in a ball and not fight the water until it quit the whirlpool let me go. Archie de Riker tried repeatedly to grab onto a life raft. The life raft would come out of the sea, just like an empty bottle surface, and it would just become airborne. Oh, I'd say 10, 15, 20 feet in the air. We'd just fly up here, and then when we hit, it would knock off the people who were trying to hang on to the life raft. And then they would be scrambling, trying to get back on board, and I had hair then. They would be pulling my hair and my eyes, and trying to they, they'd grab your nose or whatever they get a hold of, trying to get aboard. I went through this about three times, and I decided that I didn't want any more of it, and I left the life raft. And I swam off by myself. The sailors didn't know how long it would be before help might arrive, or whether it would come at all. As night fell, so did their chances of survival. It's so big out there, and it's so scary. I was by myself in the middle of South Pacific, hanging in a life jacket, wondering, What's going to happen next? Is, am I ever going to be seen? Will I drift and drift? After battling the seas alone for 12 hours, Pat Duhan finally caught sight of other survivors. I saw this little light bobbing. I yelled, and I heard a voice yelling, Who is it? And I said, It's Pat. Well, it was some of the fellows off our ship in a life raft. And so I made my way over. They pulled Pat inside the raft, and together, the 15 sailors lasted through another night. Their ordeal was far from over. Morning light revealed yet one more danger. In addition to high winds and turbulent seas, the sailors now faced another threat, sharks. The first thing we saw that next morning were dorsal fins. They were 12 to 14 feet long sharks and they circled. Every once in a while, they'd make a pass and turn over like they were gonna go at us. They could have very easily at any time come in there and just got our legs without any problem at all. I heard this swish, I looked around. It was this big old fin, this old shark fin. I mean, it was a big one. And he was circling me. I said, you know, God, I said, first you sink my ship. I said, then you have me swim in this ocean all night. And now you're gonna feed me to the sharks. I said, that just ain't right. Hunger, exhaustion, fear. Time passed slowly. Ray Schultz thought of his young bride back in California. I just wondered what my family was going to do and what they were going to think and just try hard to make it. The worst of the typhoon had passed, but hundreds of men remained stranded in the water. By nightfall on December 18, 1944, the typhoon that had ripped through the U.S. Navy's third fleet in the South Pacific was finally losing strength. Admiral Bull Halsey shuddered at the news that four of his ships, with hundreds of sailors aboard, were missing. He immediately alerted the fleet to be on the lookout for survivors. One of the missing ships was the USS Taberer, a destroyer escort that had managed to stay afloat during the typhoon. But she had lost her mast and all radio communication. The crew went to work on repairs. First job they had to do was to rig a, an antenna so we could communicate by radio. While up on deck rigging the emergency antenna, Chief Radio Man Ralph Tucker saw a small flicker of light in the water. 
and he thought he heard a voice, so he yelled out, man overboard. We didn't know where anybody was, and we couldn't see very far. Battling rain and towering waves, the ship zeroed in on the flickering light. They got close enough to determine there was a sailor in the water. He was wearing a life jacket equipped with a single cell flashlight and whistle. With the waves so high, you would only see that, that man's little flashlight maybe one second out of ten because he was riding the waves too. They struggled to move the ship into position so they could scoop the man out of the water. Once close enough, they threw the sailor a rope. So when the ship rolled towards him, they heaved on that line and pulled him right to the ship. The Taberer had rescued its first survivor from the hull, second class petty officer A.R. Lindquist. That was the first that we had known that a destroyer had sunk or any ship had sunk. That's the first thought I had. If there's one here, there's more. So the Taberer continued her rescue mission. We had cargo nets thrown over the side and then as we rolled, there would, the guys would go down the cargo nets or into the water and get him and get him on the cargo nets and climb back on board. Within an hour and a half, 11 men were pulled from the sea, all survivors of the USS Hull. Henry Plage took an extraordinary risk. He turned on his searchlights. It was a move that could expose the tabby to Japanese subs. I had two lights that were turned on. Of course, I thought about the submarines, but I figured that a submarine in this storm would not be on the surface where he could see us. He would be deep, where it's not stormy. His instincts were right. The Taberer picked up more sailors. By the next morning, the rough water and strong winds had scattered the men. Archie de Riker, who was floating alone in the water, remembers the relief he felt when he finally saw the Taberer in the distance. I could see that the smoke from his stack going in one direction, and then he would obviously turn toward us and then go back the other direction. He did this a few times, and he was getting fairly close. De Riker began to slash and holler. Then the Taber came alongside, and the glorious crew of the Taber, and they had their divers, you know, their swimmers in the water, swimming around, helping pull us aboard. Buoyed by the excitement of being rescued, De Riker didn't realize how fatigued his body was. They always ask each man, are you all right? Can, can you walk? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm fine. And let go of me, and I fell right down on the deck. All through that morning, the Taberer plucked men out of the water. At 1 p.m. on the 19th, with his radio communications now repaired, Plage got a message from Admiral Halsey ordering the Taberer to head back to formation so they could survey the ship's damage and start on repairs. Halsey had other rescue ships ready to take over the Taberer's mission. But as Plage started back to the rendezvous point, he spotted more men in the water along the way. I had a choice to make. I could either uh, go onto the rendezvous and leave possibly more men in the water, or I could stay and try and save another man. Plage disobeyed Halsey's orders and kept the rescue effort going. Three hours later, he had rescued three more men. But dozens of men, including Pat Duhan and Ray Schultz, were still in the water, uncertain of their fate. I never thought I had a chance of making it in that water. I didn't think anybody could survive there. Ray Schultz was floating with three fellow sailors when he saw a ship in the distance. About five or six that evening, I seemed to come over the horizon. And uh, so I thought it was, at first I thought, geez, that's not look like one of the Navy ships. It must be a Japanese. The ship zeroed in on the men. I thought, well, we're going to be prisoners. And I heard some guy say, there's another one over there. And they started firing the machine guns around us. And I thought, oh, hell, they're going to shoot us. The target wasn't the sailors in the water, 
but the sharks circling them. What we did was to break out some rifles and put some guys on the upper deck with rifles, and they would try to keep the sharks away, and they did. By now, Schultz knew the shooters were his fellow fleet members. He hadn't recognized the Taberer without her mast. And then they threw me a line, I just tied around my waist, and they pulled me up on deck. By the time he was rescued, Schultz had been in the water for 33 hours. He had survived the cruel storm as well as the sharks. Not all the men out on the water were so fortunate. Then, with Admiral Halsey's blessing, the Taberer kept at it. Once we got started doing it, then it became a wonderful chore, you know, to maneuver and hunt for more, and then when you found them, to get them on board. We did it the first night, all the next day, and all the next night. At 8.40 on the morning of December 20th, the USS Taberer was relieved of her mission by others in the fleet. After working more than 36 hours straight, the Tabby had rescued 55 men. As other ships, such as the USS Brown and the Rudyard Bay took over, still more men were rescued. Pat Duhan had been in the water for 72 hours when he saw a sign of hope early on December 21st. It was the USS Brown. When we saw that destroyer coming over the horizon and coming up alongside of it, that was something that is, is there's no way to express how you feel. Finally, Duhan's wait in the water was over. He and 12 others in the raft were rescued. Despite the many dangers the South Pacific presented, its warm 70-degree water was crucial to the men's survival. The fact we're in warm water was one of the major factors in all of us surviving. When the search and rescue mission was called off on December 22nd, a total of 98 men had been saved. Admiral Halsey later asserted that never before in history had a search and rescue mission of such scope been carried out. Despite the valiant efforts, 790 U.S. sailors perished in the typhoon. As the ships gathered at the atoll they used as home base, Bull Halsey knew he would have to answer the inevitable questions of how the third fleet had been caught so off guard and who was responsible. But he could never have imagined the next disaster that awaited them. U.S. forces were still waging war in the South Pacific in mid-December 1944 when the third fleet regrouped at Ulithi to make repairs. The fleet had been devastated by a killer typhoon Three ships capsized, 790 men died. Now, Admiral Bull Halsey had a lot of explaining to do. After a event where ships are damaged or lost, and loss of life is involved, it's appropriate to have a court of inquiry. Uh, it's common sense, it's due process. On December 26th, a formal court of inquiry was convened aboard the USS Cascade to examine the facts. After hearing testimony from 54 witnesses, the court returned the following opinion. The preponderance of responsibility attaches to Commander Third Fleet, Admiral William F. Halsey. The mistakes made were errors in judgment committed under stress of war operations. Halsey's responsibility was that of the commander who had uh, somehow allowed the conduct of the military mission to obliterate the consideration of the safety of the ships. Admiral Halsey could have made some perhaps better judgment calls, but he was very successful in accomplishing his basic mission of supporting the invasion of Mindoro. And where he, this could have been handled better, that's part of the price you pay for being at sea in war. It was decided that no disciplinary action would be taken. This was at a critical point in the war. Halsey was a national hero. They did not think that it would serve the, the purpose of the war effort or of the Navy or of the United States to relieve him. 
On the morning of January 3rd, 1945, Admiral Bull Halsey greeted the sailors aboard the newly repaired USS Taberer. On behalf of the Secretary of the Navy, Halsey awarded the crew the Navy Unit Commendation. They knew they had jobs to do, and so they did them. Many of them risked their lives to help these men in the water. And you can't ask more than that from a man. The Admiral then pinned the Legion of Merit Cross on the chest of Lieutenant Commander Henry Plage for his heroic leadership in the Taberer's rescue mission. An emotional crew cheered the recognition. Our guardian angel, Captain Plage, he did this magnificent job, and it's totally in that man's favor that he did this and his crew because without them me or my family would not be here today i got more respect for henry plage than anybody i know the giving of self in a harrowing situation like that can't be measured in ribbons or medals or even story it's the giving of everything you have On December 30th, the Third Fleet sailed out of the harbor's safety to return to battle. For the next five months, U.S. forces performed heroically at Manila and Iwo Jima. By June, the Third Fleet was providing cover, trying to wrap up the victory of Okinawa. Then on June 3rd, the unthinkable happened. Admiral Halsey was aboard his flagship, the USS Missouri, just off Okinawa, when he received a typhoon warning. With memories of the December typhoon still fresh, Halsey maneuvered the fleet away from the storm. He was careful not to retreat too far from his strategic position. A few hours later, a destroyer sent a critical storm update. The typhoon had changed direction. Once again, the cumbersome decoding process delayed the weather information, and Halsey did not receive the warning. He led his ships directly into the path of the typhoon. This time, however, it was the large ships, or big boys, that caught the brunt of the storm. First Class Petty Officer Frank Gesualdo was aboard the aircraft carrier USS Hornet when the weather started getting rough. We knew we were in trouble when we were bouncing around the ship. It's like uh, being in an airplane. You hit an air pocket, you drop a few feet, and you wonder what the hell's going on. Seaman First Class Ralph Hinson remembers the strength of the waves. You would come out, and then sometimes you'd, the ship would be on the top of this wave, and then it would shudder. And then, and then come back down again. Water was everywhere. And those waves were large. They, they were large. The men aboard the Hornet did their best to hold on. You make sure you buckle up your shorts good and tight. And you say your prayers. And you think about Mother. And you say an extra Hail of Mary. And let it be. The crew battled the seas for hours. After the worst had passed, the men were shocked to see just how strong the winds and waves had been. The steel flight deck of their ship was mangled around the bow. We couldn't figure our flight deck, you know. Who, who can bend a flight deck? It's impossible, but it happened. And if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't have believed it. Though this second typhoon was shorter lived than the first, it ravaged the fleet. 33 ships were damaged, 76 planes destroyed, and six sailors killed. Another court of inquiry was assembled. This time, the court made a recommendation to relieve Halsey of his command. It was decided that even though the weather information had been delayed, Admiral Halsey had made a grave error by allowing the ships to remain so close to the storm's path. The Secretary of the Navy never acted on the court's recommendation. Halsey remained in command. After they came out of that second typhoon experience, the Admiral sent a very firmly worded letter strongly recommending that the Navy develop a systematic weather reconnaissance operation to ensure that the fleet 
will be given better meteorological information in the future. Thanks in part to Admiral Halsey's insistence, the U.S. Navy instituted regular weather reconnaissance squadrons. Today, the need for storm tracking remains vital to the Navy ships on active duty around the globe. Typhoons continue to be, even 50 years later, the biggest challenge for, our, for mariners at sea and for the United States Navy. Modern technology has also helped the U.S. Navy stay a step ahead in the deadly game of outwitting typhoons. We are very fortunate that today we have the technology that allows us to see where tropical storms may originate and when they do, where they're moving and how intense they are. At the Joint Typhoon Warning Center in Pearl Harbor, Navy weather experts watch for typhoons over 100 million square miles of open ocean area. The Joint Typhoon Warning Center is here to distribute bulletins and warnings to the Department of Defense. We run a 24-hour watch. They're 12-hour shifts. I've got 30 people on watch, three at a time. It seems to be working. Today, the U.S. Navy tracks about 75 tropical cyclones a year and issues warnings to the Pentagon. The Navy has managed to avoid repeating the death and destruction that crippled the Third Fleet. But the war between Halsey's fleet and the forces of nature still serves as a powerful reminder. The Typhoon of 44 presented an enemy that many of the sailors of the Third Fleet had never confronted before. And there was a certain time in every one of those skippers' minds where the enemy was no longer the Japanese. Battling the elements, you, you can't fight back. The enemy, you can. I think any one of us who survived would have rather lost our ship in a battle than lost it in a typhoon. But there was no question that day. The forces of nature were the enemy. Nature is the winner all the time. You can't beat it. December 21st, 1944. It's been three days since a typhoon tore through the Pacific, battering the U.S. Navy's third fleet and sinking three ships. Second-class sonarman Pat Duhan and 12 other men are still hanging inside a life raft. They keep close watch on the sharks that have been circling them for hours. Two men in their group have already died from exposure. Everybody's kind of hallucinating, and some of the fellows had given up, and uh, we just were, we were drifting. And uh, all of a sudden, one of the fellows said, there's some ships on the horizon. We looked over, and being destroyer sailors, we saw this big cloud of black smoke. And we knew a destroyer was lighting off. In other words, they were lighting their boilers, and they were going to full speed to come and pick us up. And that was at USS Brown. They pulled along alongside of us and threw us a line. And when they threw us that line and started pulling us in, the sharks went into friends and started attacking us. And they had to bring out guns and shoot, shoot at them to keep them away from us. But they got us all on board. Duhan cannot stand up and has lost 50 pounds, but he knows that he's fortunate to have survived. 790 sailors have perished. The Third Fleet is unable to support General MacArthur's campaign in Mindoro. When I play taps, I always think of those 202 of my shipmates that didn't make it. Five days later, on December 26th, a court of inquiry finds Admiral Halsey responsible for the tragedy. He's blamed for making errors in judgment due to wartime stress. He is not punished. In all, only 92 men were pulled alive from the wild waters of the Pacific. Of those, 55 were saved by Lieutenant Commander Henry Plage and the crew of the USS Tabor. You look at them and you're just totally grateful. And I'll tell you, I have more respect for them than I have anything, anybody, especially the skipper.
And if anybody deserves a Medal of Honor, I think it's Henry Plage. It really is a great feeling to know that life is worth something and people think that way about you. See, we'd have a rendezvous point out there where we would turn and go towards Hawaii or go east and the group that we were supposed to meet were coming from the west coast going west. We'd rendezvous with them on a certain day at a certain hour and we'd replenish. They would come alongside with their ammo, and then their ship stores, food, we'd come on board. And then we would uh, get aviation gasoline, and then we these are from tankers come alongside of us, the big long hoses, and uh, oil, fuel oil to keep going. And then after that Halsey uh, tornado that, or Nimitz tornado that we had out there, when all those well we went through a terrible, terrible typhoon out there. That's when uh, three destroyers capsized. Well, they ran out of fuel. From then on, after that was over with, it lasted for about a week, we were out there in that terrible, terrible weather, and uh, the planes were on some place, on some ships were loose from the decks and they would slide with the, because we were rolling so bad. However, they were chained down or roped down so they couldn't move, but some would, would tear loose. So. There was a, quite a bit of damage done. We were just getting pounded. But the hmm. smaller ships, whew, you couldn't even see them. You look up, you're steering your ship, and you're looking out to the porthole, and you, you see a destroyer or a cruiser out there. And maybe you'd see the cruiser, but you wouldn't see the destroyer. They'd be down in the swell of a big wave. Well, as a result, three destroyers capsized, and uh, all hands were gone. That's about, about probably a thousand people went down with the ship. After that, uh, Typhoon, we, uh, the destroyers would come alongside the larger ships and get topped off with more fuel. They'd get it from us instead of from a tanker. We'd, we'd get it from the tankers, put it on, on our ship, and the destroyers would come in one by one and go to the larger ships and get topped off from the larger ship to the, to the destroyers. But they were not supposed to be below 50% of capacity at all times. So they were coming in and out all the time. Whenever there was a chance to uh, transfer fuel or gas or come alongside and the seas weren't too rough, I, they would do it. They'd come right along, pull right alongside us, pull right up, right up here, right on the quarter deck here. Lines would come over, and all the work was done back there. Uh, baskets of oranges and food, and, and powdered this, powdered that. A lot of uh, yeah, eggs, of course, and potatoes, and flour. We had a terrible time with flour. As a matter of fact, when we went to chow, the first thing we would do was look at our bread and hold it up to the light, and you see little dark spots in there. Full of bugs. <laughs> they were alive. <laughs> you push your slice of bread down, <laughs> they start walking around the table. <laughs>